guys. Um, hello, everybody. Hello here. Hello in the, on the internet. Um, if anyone's watching from um, Territory Studio, I'm going to see what you did today, so um, be afraid. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, what we did on uh, Ghost in the Shell, the film that came out, was it this year? Yeah, this year. Oh, Jesus Christ. Um, this March, I guess. Um, we started to work on this project. Um, you know, a few words about myself. That's my name. I work as our creative lead, sometimes VFX supervisor, sometimes CG supervisor, for a company called Territory Studio. And um, the company was uh, founded in 2010. I joined in 2011-ish. Uh, and these are some of the films that we worked on. And um, all through these works, we use Cinema 4D. So um, I, can, I can definitely say that Cinema 4D is really good uh, for these sort of projects. And what we started to do in the last couple of months and years is uh, we started to integrate Cinema 4D a little bit more into a proper visual effects pipeline. Um, I'm going to say a few things about that as well, uh, but let's start with the creative stuff. So Ghost in the Shell, um, I don't know how many of you have seen the original film or how many of you know about the original comic books. Um, that was a really important film to quite a few guys in the studio, including me. Uh, so when we started to get um, into talks about being able to contribute to this film, we were absolutely delighted, and we were ready to jump um, at the very first moment when we were starting to discuss uh, how to approach the creative challenges. Um, before we get into that, let me just show you a few things that we did on this film. <laughs> Lovely, thank you very much. Um, so we um, got a phone call from uh, Fiona, the VFX producer, and uh, Guillaume, the VFX supervisor, about um, they would uh, love us to do some creative concepting on how holographic technology works in the Ghost in the Shell world. And uh, when you think about the work that we usually do, or we did in the past. It's more about screens and 2D UI interfaces and integrating those into a story. Um, and this was very, very different. This was about <clears throat> creating holographic technology. So one of the things early on that was said is there's no need for traditional 2D screens. Everything needs to be volumetric. Uh, everything needs to be three-dimensional. And um, I think that's a great brief to start to work on. So the first thing that we tried to tackle uh, was called the Hologlobe. And the Hologlobe was the centerpiece of this uh, holographic technology. It's, um, it's a very sophisticated device that allows you to communicate with other people, to uh, search for data, search for 
information, to connect to other people. And uh, when we hear something like this, it's, it's really cool because that's when we start thinking about how this technology could work. Um, when we got the brief, we knew that there was a physical device that was built on set, which looked like uh, a dish. And because it was called the Hologlobe, we initially envisaged something that's a spherical thing. Uh, but quite early on, we established that it doesn't need to be spherical. It doesn't need to be um, well-defined. It, it should be flexible. It should be almost like, you know, it could do anything that you want it to do. So one of the first things that we do usually is create sketches or scribbles and these are actual uh, images that I've sort of like photographed from my notebook. And these are all uh, done in the middle of a meeting. So not really well thought out, just quickly putting ideas into paper. And, and uh, one of the most important aspects of the work that we do is actually the logic behind it. So we started to establish how this technology could work. Could we fill this spherical space with particles that start to light up when you process something through them. There are all sorts of ideas like this. So that was the first concept that we did, which is a nice marriage of something that's really new, which was the holographic stuff, and a nice marriage of what we usually do, which is the more 2D-based UI. Um, this here was a lovely, lovely uh, contribution uh, from a guy called Stylo. He designed this based on a traditional Japanese pattern called Asanoha. And we used that as a visual anchor to sort of like, uh, to, to mark this, to mark where the hologlobe is and, and where all these lovely things are happening. The second version of the um, interface was based on a technology that we called Digital Sand. And initially, it came from an idea that how sound could be used, or, or when they have a conversation, how can we visualize sound, and how that could sort of like drive particle simulations and all sorts of stuff like that. And then we took that idea and applied it to objects and, and the animations. And um, we talked about that this technology is not being super perfect, so sometimes particles fly out and fly up. So it's a really... Uh, living environment rather than being super precise. And I think that was a very important part of the brief that we got, that this technology is not perfect. And uh, quite early on, Guillaume mentioned that we should look back into the days of Commodore 64, or pixelated MS-DOS graphics and that kind of stuff. Because I think that was very important uh, from the starting point that Rupert Sanders did not want to have something that looks like Iron Man or anything that's a super sophisticated part of technology because as much as in Star Wars, Ghost in the Shell is a world where actual people live in and Tony Stark's world is a perfectly built, super, super rich person's superhero's world where everything is possible. However, this needed to be a little bit more grounded. Um, I try to be a little bit faster just to make sure that everything that I want to talk about fits into here. This is a lovely close-up of, um, of the digital scent concept. And quite early on, the reason why we see this ship quite a lot of times is when we started to work on this, there was a sequence in the film which dealt with how the major tries to trace back who she was or who she is. And part of that journey was uh, she plucked herself into this hologlobe and went through all sorts of archive footage that dealt with um, her parents being murdered on a ship and all sorts of stuff like that. So when we started to explore the particles a little bit more, we created little concepts like this, which is, uh, you know, that was, that was one of the early concepts that we established, how the Hologlobe can write out uh, physical information. So this is a guy called Dr. Osmond. He was a character in the film. And at one point, uh, the major scrolls through a scene and he, and she sort of like tries to see what everybody was doing there. And, and that was a nice way of trying to um, write out these ideas. So 
Here's another little montage of different tests that we did. Is it playing again? No. Let's get back. So as you see here, we started to do what we like to do, and that's experimenting with all sorts of stuff. So we rendered lots of passes, we rendered out sketch and tune passes, particles, shaders. Uh, we did quite physical stuff with real sand-like stuff. And, um, and we presented it to the, the um, VFX supervisor. Um, and that was the base of the um, digital sand concept. So then we moved on to another concept, which was very similar, but it was more voxel-based. So rather than having very tiny particles, we started to have little cubes. And I think uh, if you watch the film, how many, have you watched the film or have you seen the film? Um, the final look, the voxel-based kind of look, was quite important. So it was great to see that something that we touched up on quite early on managed to make, uh, make it itself into a film in some sort of a form. So again, here's a little breakdown of how we create these concepts. Again, rendering out lots of details, certain passes, UI stuff. And, and we use a backplate to do that from the film that was provided by the um, production. So here's another version of the Hologlobe, and this is when we took things a little bit further. Um, this, is, this is much more like what we usually did in the past. It's full of lovely UI details and graphics and really well designed. Um, but because the initial idea of the production was to take it into a more stripped back way uh, that was never, never really taking off. However, this was, a, this was a version of the Hologlobe that we did for the temp shots. Um, whilst we were working on these concepts, we were working in temp shots uh, for the film. I don't know if you're familiar with the term, but those are almost like post-visualization shots. So they shot the plate and they ask us to do something very, very quickly, which is, you know, it's absolutely a magical thing to have Cinema 4D on board for these kind of tasks, because when we turn around a shot like this, uh, it's usually half a day, a day's work, or something like that, which is, which is really, really good. Um, because what they do with these shots is they start to cut that into the edit, and they start to see how well the narrative works, and I think this, this was a scene when Aramaki's character, or Aramaki, was instructing the Major not to do the dive. And it was really important to show that there's something going on on a certain floor. As you see, this is quite close to the version that made it into the film. But what made it into the film was designed by MPC. So uh, when we stopped working on these temp shots, those designs uh, or similar designs were taken further by those guys, and they did a lovely job creating their own versions of these um, holographic devices. Here's another little montage of something that you probably haven't seen before. Um, let's go back to this. Um, this is a Dr. Ulet from the film, and this is her safe house. And the task here was to create uh, a version of the Hologlobe that acts as a communication device. She was talking to someone, and there needed to be some sort of visualization of the sound. And um, if you think back of the original uh, di digital sound concept that I showed you earlier, this is quite similar to that. And this is pretty much based on that kind of idea. Um, as you see, there's quite a few versions of this. And uh, one version of this shot made it into the trailer, but then it was later edited out. So it's a cool world out there. Way further down the line, when um, we were still trying to come up with anything uh, that's working as a concept for the Hologlobe, we developed these sort of little tests with a, with a geisha, because one of the narrative points in this sequence was that the Major goes through the scene that happened before. 
uh, that which was when she went into the hotel and there was the dying robot a geisha and uh, she figured out that it was hacked and we had to find ways of uh, trying to make sure that the idea comes through time time is great um, the conference room if you watched Ghost in the Shell, the conference room is an iconic scene. It's, a, it's pretty much visually one of the things that everyone sort of like remembers watching that film. Um, again, we got the brief to come up with holographic technology for that part of the movie quite early on. Last, I think it was probably June, July-ish, maybe a bit earlier, some, somewhere around that time. The brief was create holograms, but create holograms that don't look like holograms, create holograms that we haven't seen before, and create holograms that are volumetric, voxel-based, physical, three-dimensional. And again, this is where Cinema 4D really shines for us, because we just, we got these models from the production. Uh, these were photogrammetry captured assets. Um, so what we did with them is we uh, decimated those very high polygon assets, converted them into a more manageable mesh, and started to use them as a base to create all sorts of passes, uh, particles, particle simulations, various stuff like that. Um, I think I probably can show you something that shows how we deal with these kind of things, if you're interested in Cinema 4D. Ah. Here's the, deal. Here's, here's, here's the deal. Let's do it this way. There you go. I wasn't right. It's on the other side, right? Cool. Where was it? Have you seen Cinema 4D somewhere? I'm pretty sure I've seen. Really? Okay, you know what? Um, oh, there you are. Hello. Welcome back. So this is something I created earlier. This, this is a very simple scene. And this uses uh, just a basic shift model to show you how we started to play with volumetric technology. As you see, this is an X particle simulation that I cached. And in its particle form, well, it looks interesting, but not what we really wanted to see. So what we did is we applied some uh, it's going to be interesting. I'm going to do that. So we applied uh, emitter generator sprite. That's what we are dealing with. So we created sprites, and immediately we have something that's more voxel-based. And because uh, particles are colliding with other particles, and there are some physical things happening in this space, we immediately have something that could be used as an interesting method to write out holograms. And if you take any shape, you could fill those with these kind of particles, and you have something. So um, going back to the presentation. Well, oh, there you are. Sweet. So this is pretty much based on that kind of thing I showed you earlier. Plus, we had some. Uh, particles leaving trails behind, and I think we had Fresnel-based render passes. Uh, we used basically everything that we could to create these sort of variations. And again, these are very, very quickly done. These are done in a day or half a day or two days. Um, and it's really, really cool to see that these kind of concepts can um, happen this quick. That makes everyone really happy. Um, another variation of that same kind of thing, you see, this is made out of voxels, some bigger particles, some sketch and tune shading, and some shader-based stuff. So this is how it looks when we start to integrate it into a scene. We had this uh, 3D setup where we populated with these uh, particle-based renders. We created this grid kind of thing, which was really nice to see that a version of it popped up in the film as well. I'm pretty sure that everyone else who worked on this film had the same idea. Um, this was, I think this was our last version of the concept that we did. Uh, and then we 
were told by the production that we shouldn't work on this anymore, which is, which is always a bit, a bit of a sad moment because you create these great ideas, you think these are great ideas and then because it's not about us, it's not about what we do, it's about the film. Uh, that's one of the things that we had to learn whilst working in films, that it's not about you, it's not about who you create or what you create or how good it is, it's about the greater concept that is the film and everything is, everything is done to make sure that the original idea comes through. So this is just a little illustration of how those particles or a variation of those particle setups look like in Cinema 4D. Again, particles emitted from the surface, creates little trails, veranda every hair, boom, you're there. Um, here's a li another little cross section of various techniques that we used. Um, this one, that's some turbulence added to particles. This is a mixture between sketch and tune and uh, I think some Boolean based shader. That's the voxel stuff. And that one over there is X particles. So again, these are created very, very quickly, very efficiently, thanks to Cinema 4D's great uh, workflow. So the next part of the concept uh, or, the, or the work that we did was the temp shots and the trailer. And um, the temp shots I probably mentioned earlier, these are very quick shots that we have to do to make sure that everyone understands the narrative. So they are not necessarily the highest quality, but they needed to be turned around in extremely short times. And again, this is where Cinema 4D was really, really important because we were able to do these kind of things very efficiently. We set up little templates where we had established this, the scene scale. Um, some of the shots we tracked ourselves within Cinema 4D and in a bigger VFX production, that's part of the pipeline that's usually done not in-house but somewhere else. You have to wait for those plates to go out and for the track to come in. And for us to be able to do that in-house whilst working on these shots, that was, that was fantastic. So this is something that I don't think it was seen before. Um, this is a, a screen grab from, from a sequence that never made it into the film. This is again the Major's uh, home, if you will. And she's trying to solve the case that you know, happened earlier in the hotel. And we had these very quick concepts which were quite motion graphics based, uh, quite a lot of 2D UI stuff in there with some volumetric stuff. Um, here's another frame from this. I think we created at least 30, 40 shots like this, uh, which were longer narrative sequences. And uh, that was really important in terms of how the film uh, came about. Then we moved on to the trailer. And when you start working on a trailer shot, that's a slightly different ball game because uh, that's when you really have to make sure that everything that you do fits into a much, much bigger production. And whatever you do goes to quite a few other artists, vendors. Uh, it needs to adhere to a certain pipeline. It needs to be a certain size. It needs to be rendered in a certain way. It needs to be in a certain color space. And, and um, you have to make sure that it happens every time. And um, that, was, that was such a, I think it's always a, I don't know how, how many of you are working in this field of visual effects or motion graphics. Is, is there anyone who works in this field? Um, if you work with VFX houses, quite often one of the things that they say, you don't use Maya, you can't be serious, which I don't really agree with. And um, I'm using Cinema 4D since version six and six and a half. And, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that it can do, I'm, I'm pretty sure everything that other software can do. And it's not about the software we all know, it's about the artist. But Cinema 4D is really, really flexible. And if you use it um, with, the, with some clever uh, ways, you can, you can create great stuff. And, and it doesn't matter if it wasn't done in Maya or anything else. It looks great, it does the thing, so it's all cool. 
I'll talk too much about this. So this is a little montage again that shows you the different versions we created for the trailer. We did some tracking. We populated the space with uh, the required assets. And we started to create versions of this. And, and one thing that you have to know about visual effects is it's a really iterative process. In motion graphics, it's quite often happens that an artist works on a piece, renders it, finishes it, comps it, and everybody is happy. In visual effects, it's always a, a teamwork. And quite often, the finish of the shot happens not even in our studio or somewhere else. So we needed to make sure that if you position this Quite funny that this is a Heineken bottle, so <laughs> I, just re I just recognize that we are at the right place at the right time. Um, so when you do something like this, it's, it's gonna, that's going to always be there, and you name it correctly. So it's not going to be like asset 16, 5Z, whatever. It's going to be named correctly, and if you change it with another version of the asset, it's still going to be in the same place. It's still going to be at the right scale and every, everyone knows that what they can expect. I guess that's what I wanted to say. So let's see the final version of the shot that we delivered for the trailer. As you see, this is much shorter than what we worked on. But again, this is part of the uh, movie making magic. You create sequences that are 100 frames long, and that gets chopped down to 10. Um, a few things that we did here. The fish, we used the Cinema 4D character module to animate the fish, rigged it very, very quickly. Uh, we laid down some splines around the buildings, and uh, it was great. It, it really worked really well. The Heineken bottle, uh, we modeled it, did some fluid simulations. Um, I think we did it in, I don't know what we did uh, there, but we had some fluid simulations. And we, create, we started to create all these lovely assets. Um, which are quite wild. And some of these assets were provided by the production, uh, designed by Ash Thorpe, and I think we used one or two of those. Uh, but this pretty much shows you the complexity. So I think at the end we used like 10 um, assets in this shot. I think this breakdown probably shows you the elements that we put in there. I don't even remember how many versions of the shot we did. Quite a lot. Um, I think this is a great time to show you some more Cinema 4D stuff. Yep. If I can get my cursor back. Lovely. So what I'm going to show you is this. Uh, this is an alembic baked version of the um, Lovely Heineken bottle. Texture. I don't think it's in the folder, so I shouldn't have done that. So this is what happens here. Um, one of the great things about this was that it needed to be slow motion, which is always good when you do even just kind of low res fluid simulations. So it's 300 frames simulated, and then we sort of like condensed it into uh, a little bit less. When we do something like this, and when you work in, in, in shots like this, what we tend to do is bake it down into alembics. That way, nothing can happen. It always stays the same. You can relink it very, very quickly. So that's a, that's a great, great thing to have. And um, as I heard, the alembic tools even got better in R19. So we are really looking forward to see that. Uh, that's another little element that I wanted to show you. I mean, I, what I like to do here is, is just show you that these are actual live assets, so these are not pre-cached stuff. And uh, this setup, this sort of language that we developed for the more civic parts of this Ghost in the Shell world, they were really sort of like quite um, simple setups. They were done with, with, a, with the MoGraph module. We animated little sequences in After Effects and used that to drive these sort of uh, particle, uh, not particle, but voxel-based kind of like little structures. And again, um, the brief here was to create something that ties into the bigger world 
So it's voxels, little cubes, but it's really low fi, really low tech. Um, I think that was a term that Guillaume used most of the time. Um, so it doesn't need to be super sophisticated, but it needs to be different. We can't have a little 2D card there that says stop. So we animated all these, and um, I think uh, I'm not sure if there's any animation on this one now, but yeah, there is. Yeah, so little figures walking, turning into the walk sign, and all this is driven by image sequences. So when we create something, we create an XREF, put it into the scene, and then when we finalize the scene, we just bake it into an alambic and it's, uh, we take it into render. Again, another little thing that probably you haven't seen before. This is one of the shots from the trailer, again, that we did. The famous YC80 shot. And um, as you see, this went through quite a few iterations. This was the original plate, I think. Uh, that version, we had these lovely... Uh, Japanese or Far East Asian food bowl, which we really loved, but uh, Guillaume and Rupert said that we should do something else. So we did another version of this, and that wasn't well received. And then we added the snake, which, which is here. In the original version, that was quite different, as you see. Um, I think the, the original plate had some sort of a glowing orange light around the, the uh, neck of the guy. And then we created that bow, uh, which is very similar to one of the original assets, but we had to recreate it. Um, we created this map here. That was quite important. We created all these prices and whatever. So this is slightly different from, from the street scene because this is the red light district. So it's a little bit more CD. Um, and let's see how this, how this breakdown looked. So as you see, again, this is a proper VFX shot. We had to remove things from the background. We had to render that little extension to make, it, make sure it looks like this part of the wall. Um, yeah, and, and, and all this was created in Cinema 4D. The snake, the snake looks really, really complex. No, it doesn't. But this is how we did it. Where is my cursor? Yeah, there we are. Snake. Boom. That's the snake. So what's happening there is I think this is a... Let's see what we did. I think this is baked, but this was a, a bend Bend deformer. We were, we were thinking about, yeah, shall we rig the snake? Shall we put in hundreds of joints in there to make sure that it could look super cool and physically accurate and whatever? No one really cares about when, you know, it's, it's the final result. If you paint it frame by frame, good. If you use the bend deformer to bend the snake's head or neck, that's also cool. Oh, we have still a bit of time. Lovely. Let's crack on with this. Yeah, uh, you've seen this. And then uh, we got to the third part of the job, which was actually the, the biggest part. Uh, and that was uh, when we created all these assets that MPC used to flesh out the world with. So the brief was, we had quite a few different uh, briefs on this one, but one of the, one of the briefs, briefs was about solograms. And sologram is a term that was coined by Rupert Sanders, and it means a special kind of hologram, a hologram that's visible in sunlight, and that's volumetric, and that's, from a certain distance, it looks almost real, but when you get close, it looks uh, quite pixelated. So that's the, that's the technological background of it. And what it, uh, they did is they shot photogrammetry uh, assets. Uh, and when I say shot, they actually used an 80 camera rig and they uh, filmed performances done by actors on set. And they created a frame by frame reproduction of these meshes. And they turned it into a massive, very, very huge file size asset that they gave us. And 
they had these, I, th I don't know how many assets they had, 60, 70, or maybe even more than that. Um, but they were lacking context. So we had, I mean, like, we had half-naked women dancing around or, or um, some, some guys beating up one another or a little kid giving a flower to his daddy or the other way around. Um, and one of the tasks that we had to do was to come up with ideas that could live within these holograms or could work with these holograms. So what we started to do, again, created concepts. We know that there's an um, asset where a little girl is playing me there. Obviously, these elements were not there. So, okay, let's create a virtual piano-like thing where you can learn music. Or, you know, that was the, I think that was the football player. The football player was running on a treadmill and the brief was to create like uh, flowing trails behind it. Or one of the ideas was that the basketball player plays between houses and, and um, yeah, and all, all these other elements. So these, these are pretty much the assets that we received. Um, later on, I'll, I'll be show you how it looks. Um, yes, so this is pretty much a cross-section of what we did in terms of those holograms. And again, the brief was take these guys, create elements around it, package it up, turn it into an asset, and send it to MPC. I don't know how many of these we did, but quite a lot. And the workflow that we did was we they gave us OBJ sequences, and we took it into Houdini um, and exported that as an Alembic, uh, decimated it quite heavily so all the artists could work uh, with those in their computers. And then we started to create these sort of like embellishments or sort of like just took out the middle, and the brief on this was, was create something that explodes out from the brain. Um, This shot, we really love it because that's pretty much, I mean, not pretty much, but quite a few of these assets that we did. Um, and some of these were started out as just simple assets, and some of these were actual sologram based stuff. And the Heineken bottle. I, re I really think that Heineken should do something. <laughs> um, again, this. It's just a little section of how it looks in the film. Do I have something? Uh, let me just go back to cinema for a second. Uh, 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 uh. No, that's okay. So back to the presentation. Civic assets, I, I, I've said a few words about this. Very similar brief, starting with the concept. We created, I don't know, 50, 60 of these little things. We created a 2D version of the asset, animated it in After Effects, took it into cinema, created that voxel setup, processed it through, packaged it up, created an Alembic version of it, sent it to MPC to put into the shots. I think... Uh, this just shows you how it looks. One of the interesting things is, as you see, that this is quite rough. And that was really playing well with the initial idea of this is a, a highly sophisticated technology, but it probably doesn't need to be super sophisticated at, at this level. So as if you know, the council doesn't have enough money to do this properly, which is just lower the resolution. Um, the ads. Very similar uh, type of job. Create lots of lovely assets that could live on side of buildings. Um, most of these were entirely made up by us. And we had lovely sessions when we started to play with names and, and coming up with ideas. Uh, mend name was something that was approved by the client, or I think that probably that was provided by them. This is a lovely asset, the walker. I really love it. Another Heineken bottle. What's going on here? So, uh, to a certain extent, we, 
created these as lovely sketches, and the artists had a bit of a freedom to create these kind of things. But one of the big challenges was because this went through all the, um, the process of being packaged up and sent to MPC. All of these needed to have proper, proper UVs. And that needed a bit of um, consideration from our end because one of the things that I always see that motion graphics artists don't necessarily work with clean UVs, um, which is not necessarily a problem when you work on your, on your own, but when your asset goes all the way to Montreal and someone picks it up and tries to apply a shader and the first thing that he or she sees is there are no UVs and then it gets pushed back to, to our studio and we get a, a, a letter from anyone saying that, guys, we couldn't process your asset because they didn't, they didn't have UVs. That's not, not a great thing. So, uh, I mean, like, you know, the, you mean this one here or? No, um, um, that's just because they wanted to process it in, in their own way and they do their own shaders. And one of the things that we did is we shaded this in cinema. We rendered this out as, uh, as turntables, which I'm going to talk about later. But the asset itself was basically a gray shaded ver version of the asset. And they used this as a base to create their own shaders. So essentially, they needed to replicate these kind of things. And that's why it was really important to have proper UVs. This here, again, shows, uh, shows how these ads were conceived. This is a sketch created by uh, Daniel Harris, a lovely concept artist. And um, hot stones. Obviously, we had to make sure that this means something. And everything that we do here needs to go through legal. So um, quite often, we had a bit of explanation to do because we, yeah, it's a tricky, tricky thing. You have to make sure that you don't do anything naughty. So this is when it, it's turned into an asset, right? And this is when it's animated. Again, we show this on uh, CineSync sessions with the client. The client says, great, love it, package it up. We take it back to the artist. The artist uh, creates a version where the materials are not there. It's nicely, neatly packaged. Everything is named. Everything is in groups. And we send it to MPC in this case. So the next one, that, that's again a little cross-section of uh, various assets that we did. There's the piano girl, there's the glove there. Uh, this was the, um, um, that thing there, there was the cyber criminal and the brief was create something that looks like, um, looks like this film. I don't know if you've seen the film called The Cell. Uh, and there's a horse that's sort of like taken, taken apart in slices. That was the brief that we have to do something like this with that uh, sonogram and create all these virtual um, bars around it that resemble a, a, some sort of a prisoner kind of thing going on. Again, another cross section. You can see, you can, I mean, like, you know, they use these assets to populate the city with. And I think we did quite, quite a few crazy ideas, like, you know, this one. The brief was that this guy has some data bubbles coming out of the mouth. And this is um, Sam Munnings, one of the lovely artists, great drunken monkey thing, which made it into the film, apparently. And... Um, this little street has all sorts of street signs. These, these are volumetric street signs that we did. Uh, this, this was one of, the, one of the hats that we did for this show. And again, this is another cross section. Um, you've seen this asset earlier. That's the one that you picked up. It looks fairly similar, right? Um, the dog as a newscaster, where is it? Put it there. Lovely idea. Again, uh, a bit of a fluid simulation here. That was a great thing to do. Uh, and the lady that you, you've seen earlier, the weightlifter lady. 
so how we did this, we did quite a few things. I, I told you, I showed you this Cinema 4D scenes, but one of the things that we had to realize is to be able to play on this field, we had to create some tools. Um, and one of the tools that we created was uh, we started to use Shotgun. I don't know if you know that, but we had to integrate Shotgun with Cinema 4D. Shotgun is an asset tracking or project management software that allows uh, VFX production to work efficiently, um, to track assets, to, to track versions, and all sorts of stuff. And via Python scripting, we were able to integrate it into Cinema 4D. Um, that ena enabled us to create all sorts of assets like this. So you know that this is a version of this shot. And, and, and these are some of the assets that we talked about, right? One of the other things that we did, which is here, is we created this little turntable tool, which is a quite basic setup. But it's really, it really, um, really enabled us to do, create these um, turntables very efficiently and quickly. So let me just show you how it works. We integrated that into a, a slate tool as well. Because one of the things that you have to do in a visual effects pipeline is you have to slate all your shots. So everyone, when, you sees the f when he or she sees the first frame, sees what's going on. So look dev setup. So what we have here is slate control. You can put in the shot name. In further versions, this was properly driven by data, so it was a manual. You put in the shot name. You choose what's going on here. So let's choose this one. Animation immediately creates uh, animation. You put in all these variables. And then it creates a slate on frame 1,000, because yeah. usually VFX productions uh, start there, kind of like frames on frame 1,000. So this is how it works. You see, it's up there for one um, frame. You render it straight from cinema. You can upload it to Shotgun, and then you've got. So this is the, um, the turntable tool. And what it allows us to do is very quickly, you can choose between daytime setups or a nighttime setup. You put your asset under a null, and then using different HDRs, which you can choose. So they are not baked in, but it creates a version of, of the HDR that you can use to light the asset. And um, it's, a, it's a really cool and, and um, efficient way of creating these turntables. It has a color chart as well, which is good for referencing. And uh, yeah, so th that was one of the things that we, we uh, started to do on this show, is to create little pipeline tools that enables us to operate faster and better and more efficiently. So if you go back to the presentation just for one more time, I think this is the very important moment when this is not done too many times, but these are, these are, as far as I know, most of the guys who worked on this film with us. And it's, it's sometimes really hard to put everyone's name into the film, the actual credit list. So I really thought that's a great time to, to have them up here for the world to see. So um, yeah, one of the, uh, yeah, I definitely have to thank them for the, all their hard work. And I would like to thank you as well for coming and everybody on the internet who listened to this. Um, if you have any questions, just let me know. I'm happy to answer or drop an email or anything like that. So thank you very much, guys. I really hope you enjoyed it.